guys, welcome to Manufacturing Unscripted. I'm your host, Matt Rawl. And I'm Lauren. Yeah, Lauren, so today our guest was Chad Brandon from Facility Works. What did you think about him? I mean, I when we initially talked to him, it was kind of confusing, just like our job. You know, it's a little bit confusing to talk about manufacturing things. But the conversation we had with him today really showed me how, how it all works, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, when you take a, a conversation like that and then you put it into real life, during the conversation I mentioned, like being a homeowner and not knowing how everything in your house operates, when you think of a facility like that, it really brings it all together and you can really understand what exactly it is he's doing for people. Yeah, and you can tell in his in his voice, right, the passion that he has for helping others succeed, right? And I think that's uh, truly something I don't want anyone to ever overlook when you listen to the podcast is, and he even says it is, you know, his success is their success. And I think that's super cool. Yeah. The one thing that he says too, like what he does is in the in-between. Mm-hmm. And I think that resonates a lot because so many companies are worried about their output and how, like what's making their money, but they, they tend to forget about the little things like a motor overloading or um, an engine needing certain type of maintenance that everybody overlooks. And that's the stuff that actually is pretty important. Yep. So without further ado, enjoy the show. This podcast is sponsored by Promus Incorporated, the leading provider of fully electric servo presses for manufacturing. Promus provides global support for pressing and motion control applications in multiple industries. With precise positioning and in-process force monitoring, your company will begin to see ROI on day one. Call 810-229-9334 or email sales at promisinc.com to speak with an expert engineer about your application today. Yeah, and then you got to maintain the comments. I mean, like, that's part of the conversation, Mm -hmm. and that's how your posts get seen more. And I love what I do. I Mm -hmm. have such a passion for what I do, Mm -hmm. which is why I reached out to you guys. So uh, I don't like the, like, get in people's face and, Mm -hmm. hey, what can I do for you? What can you do for Mm -hmm. me? Like... I'm, I said before, I'm all about relationships. So Mm -hmm. I've watched you guys for a long time and I've always thought, oh, it'd be so cool to be, but it was never something I felt able or qualified to reach out and be like, what do you guys think? Mm -hmm. But that passion that I have for what I do just welled up inside of me so big that when you, you uh, mentioned, like, if anybody's interested, Mm -hmm. reach out. I was like, all right, my, maybe my passion will come through, but so I can talk all day about that stuff I'm yeah. passionate about, but the second it feels like it's switching over to just free marketing, <laughs> like sales when pitchy, I, yeah, yeah, pitchy, exactly. Yeah. The second it feels like the comment section turns there, I feel like I failed, and I just want to hit the eject button. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah, that's that is the sweet spot, though, figuring out how to explain your passion in a way that isn't like I'm better than everybody else, and here's why, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. Um, well, let's get kind of into more of the meat and potatoes of what we're here for. Um, so, Chad, you're from my facility works. Facility works. Facility works. Yes. Oh, I think that's probably his facility like that. does work. Yeah, his facility <laughs> does work. Um, it must have been just on LinkedIn, and that's just maybe I don't know how it ended up like that. But web, um, web domains. Yeah. Oh, that's probably facility what it works is. was an easy one for people to poach and yeah. uh, hold hostage for yeah. money. Ah, oh, oh, so that's so. what it is. I just took it right off the website. Yep. Domain. I don't. I don't play those games. <laughs> uh, you can have it until your landscaping yep. business yep. decides it doesn't um, need a website anymore. <laughs> so let's let's talk about that, right? Because this podcast is for the passionate people about manufacturing, and I want to talk about facility works and and what it is to you and and kind of you know, what, what it is you offer. Yeah. So, um, when we talked before, everybody's got that little bit of a language barrier or whatever regarding their specific sector, right? Like I know ProMass does presses Mm -hmm. and I know based off of first impressions and being around industry that you guys are doing smart things with presses, Mm -hmm. position and feedback, load monitoring, all that stuff. Hard stop. You know, that's yeah. like, that's my knowledge base. And I'm sure you guys could go on for quite a bit longer and explain it to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's the problem we run into with reliability is we tell people that we do reliability and they say, oh, well, what's that? And we start explaining. They're like, oh, you know, oh, so your maintenance. And we say, no, you know, mm-hmm. 
we're not exactly. And so we start explaining the process development side and they're like, oh, so you're like continuous improvement or quality. It's like, no, not exactly. <laughs> yeah. You know, and then we say, well, we're the in-between space. And then they're like, oh, so you really don't do anything good. Yeah. It's like, no, that's not it. Yeah. So uh, it's it's hard to cross that language barrier, just like a lot of other sectors. But like we were talking about marketing a service business or marketing a service mm -hmm. in manufacturing is like now you're another step removed from something tangible to give and, you know, anecdotal evidence to people while you're communicating. So I came up with this analogy where say you're say you're making a casserole, right? And casserole. Taking it right probably, back to the eighties. Yeah. Eighties <laughs> casserole. Gotta love some Midwest casseroles. Oh my God. Tater tots and everything, right? <laughs> so say you're making a casserole. Operations job is order fulfillment, throughput, so on and so forth, right? They're saying, we need X amount of casseroles a week. This is how we're going to get there. We're going to use this type of stove. We need this many people to run those stoves, this many stoves. So this size of a kitchen, you know, mm -hmm. that's operations, right? Well, they start burning casseroles, you know, you got quality loss, mm -hmm. uh, process loss, stuff like that. So they say, all right, well, you know, we're going to call maintenance and maintenance is going to come out and they're going to figure out the problem. Maintenance comes out. They say, oh, this burner's flaming out, right? So you're you're burning casseroles on this side and we'll replace the burner, right? They've, mm -hmm. they've done their troubleshooting. They've maybe talked to the uh, the OEM of the stoves and they said, you know, all right, this is this is your problem. This is how we're going to fix it, right? And But you're still getting burning once in a while, you know. It, mm -hmm. it, it burns before maintenance catches it or something. They mm -hmm. come out and they fix it. You're firefighting, right? And so operations is going to talk to quality. Quality is going to say these type, this level of burning, we can't send to our customers, mm -hmm. right? This level of burn is, is acceptable. Mm -hmm. We might need to throw a little extra spices in. Here's the spice throw blend we're going to use. cheese on top. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Cheese. Add cheese and butter and everything will be fine. I'm using that one instead of spice from now on. <laughs> yeah. I love cheese. It's the glue that binds my life. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, they're going to say, hey, we're going to throw this extra cheese on top and the customer will still take it. Production says, cool. With that knowledge, I can put out this many, so I need to have this mm -hmm. many stoves running, this many people running, and there's some communication back and forth. Reliability transcends all of those groups, right? We're a holistic approach. So we come in and we say, hey, uh, based off of your throughput needs and your output, we're going to do a little condition monitoring. We're going to de design some processes, and we're going to basically eliminate your failure modes mm -hmm. so you have a calculable throughput and a calculable OEE mm -hmm. to be able to plan better, to be able to utilize your assets better. Mm -hmm. And we do that through the downrange feedback of device monitoring, uh, process identification, um, and... Uh, a quality reliability maintenance program, mm -hmm. uh, RCM, Reliability Centered Maintenance. So there's a maintenance facet to it. There's a quality continuous improvement side of it. And we work closely with production. So we're going to come in and we're going to say, hey, this burner that's flaming out, you don't have any data on when it's flaming out. So we're going to start collecting that data. Mm -hmm. On top of that, we know that the OEM of that stove says that anytime this flame comes up, replace the burner and mm -hmm. that's their only guidance so we're going to take it one step above and beyond what the oem says and we're going to do condition monitoring on that burner to when we start getting uh in a spike in surface temperature on that burner outside of spec mm -hmm. before it actually starts flaming we'll stop and we'll replace that right mm -hmm. and now we've increased oe we've reduced loss because we've uh, improved the process, improved the mm -hmm. asset through condition monitoring. And the product. And now we've entered into that continual monitoring, continual improvement cycle because production comes to us and they say, hey, you know, we're not getting black charring on this mm -hmm. one corner of our casseroles, but instead we're getting black charring across the whole top of it. And we say, well, that's strange. What's changed? You know, so we start doing analysis mm -hmm. and we figure out, oh, we lost – we we do condition monitoring on temperature we do condition and we might we might say okay there's a there's a vacuum mm -hmm. you know we've created a vacuum within the stove mm -hmm. and we know that through all these different conditions that we're monitoring and that vacuum is created because the seal on the door got compromised mm -hmm. And the seal on the door got compromised because your operators are pulling the dish out this way and dragging it across the door yep and we know that through 
watching the process. Now yeah. that now you're kind of into the operations and quality side, yeah. right? And if somebody had seen that gasket failed, they might have called out maintenance and said, hey, this gasket's bad and maintenance would have replaced the gasket and we're good to go. But reliability is the ability to reverse engineer the process to determine the failure mode, mm -hmm. alleviate the failure mode or repair, and then put a process in place so where that failure mode never happens again. So here's where you get into the sweet spot, the part that I really love mm -hmm. talking about, because everybody likes when you improvements yep. make you money, right? Say the operations has 10 stoves, right? We've actually gone into places and just by identifying uh, criticality needs based off of failure modes, you got 10 failure modes on your main motor that are consistently happening every month and two on your um, pressure building mm -hmm. that happen once every year or something like that. We're going to address, we're going to attack that main motor first. We're going to assign a criticality. This one's causing you, it's your highest loss leader. We're going to attack it, right? Say operations has 10 stoves. They're all operating at 70% OEE. Mm -hmm. We've gone in and we've actually created 20% OEE improvements just by adjusting the process and increasing reliability. So downtime is on their time, yep. not you know, yep. firefighting. Well, if we create 20% across nine stoves, that's greater than the 70% on this other stove. So not only are we assigning a criticality to taskings for your reliability and maintenance, but we assign a criticality to all of your assets. So mm -hmm. now you've got multiple levels to it. So we can say, hey, this 10th stove has been around since the 50s. There may be a use case for replacement. We've increased 20% OEE on nine machines. We can absorb all of the throughput from that machine into these other nine machines. We can decommission that, engineer a new stove that's going to put you out 10 yep. 10x throughput and yep. commission it with reliability measures so that way once it's implemented, uh, your throughput is going to be increased exponentially compared to what it mm -hmm. was if you just raised the baseline on all of your existing yep. assets with no loss. So so I think a question I would have is why aren't companies doing this in the first place? I guess w Facility Works comes in and, and they do this and this is a great service to many manufacturers and production teams. I guess where is it is it a cost thing? Is it a what do you think it is? Because there's a lot of companies that I'm sure you've dealt with that they've just done the same thing for 50 years because they're afraid of downtime, really, I think is what it is. Yeah. They don't want to take the time to review and make better because if it works, don't touch it. So the communication on what mm -hmm. we do is the and the and the fact that it touches into so many different areas in the manufacturing process mm -hmm. is the exact reason why. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a it's a re-education of the of the industry, allowing uh, helping people to realize that reliability is a thing, mm -hmm. and that it's a value add and not a cost center. Mm -hmm. uh, if people don't understand what reliability is, they're not going to see a value add. Mm -hmm. If we try to explain it to them and they say, "Oh well, you do maintenance," or "Oh yeah. well, that's just quality improvements." Well, they already have a quality manager and they already have a maintenance manager, so why would they bring in a reliability person? Yeah. Um, it's it's a re-education of the industry for sure. It's one that's been slowly happening mm -hmm. for decades now, but it's gaining a lot of momentum quickly. And we see it in our conversations. If somebody knows about how much value they can add to their process, how much they can improve their process through reliability measures – it's not a conversation of what do you do? It's a conversation of how quickly can you get to my facility? Mm -hmm. We just got a call from after the show, actually. I, I was a little, I was back and forth on whether or not it was mm -hmm. worth the marketing spend that we spent on Advanced yeah. Manufacturing Expo this year. It was a great show. I love it. But, uh, you know, just that self-doubt yep. and uh, some of the conversations we had, we had a very, very, very large manufacturer uh the person in charge of that site came to us and they were like, Hey, what do you do? Reliability. Awesome. We've been, we see that as a need. We just hired a reliability engineer. We're going to need some help. 
I'm like, cool, we got you. Mm-hmm. And he left, and I did the show thing where I'm like, talk's cheap. We'll yeah. see. You know? <laughs> like, yep. The next day, my phone was ringing. How soon can you get out here? Mm-hmm. Because they're taking it that seriously. Mm-hmm. And that's we see the whole industry turning that way. And I think that's kind of another potential like business avenue that you can go in, right, is it's – is if they do want to create their own reliability team, you can come in and educate, you know, and say this is this is the standard practice. This is this has worked for us, it could work for you. Um, and I think I think that's another opportunity there too. Is you come more of an educator <laughs> in and and help manufacturing understand the importance of reliability. So that's kind of our secret sauce, actually, is that we don't niche down to just the education because, believe it or not, there is a lot Mm -hmm. of – I don't want to put the air quotes around it because they are are extreme professionals, but Mm -hmm. there's a lot of consultants. There's Mm -hmm. a lot of uh, single-person company engineering teams for reliability Mm engineers. There's a lot of people willing to tell you this is how you do reliability. Kind of our secret sauce is – we're we're at the juncture where the rubber meets the road. Yep. We're going to help you integrate it. Yep. We're going to help you develop the process, implement, and then continual support. So that's where our trade support comes okay. in. And a lot of that's where a lot of people get lost and it's like, oh, you do maintenance. Well, we do reliability-centered maintenance as a function of supporting reliability. Well, let's talk a little bit about that secret sauce then um, without divulging too much and just – I I know you talked about, you know, um, Industry 4.0 and the technology that's been just flushed the the market. Um, But I know you said that something that you – it's important to you is is also keeping it simple. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess how are you doing that or or what what are your thoughts on that? (laughs) Vast (laughs) and many. No. (laughs) So it all boils down to just not diving in too quick. These people, Mm -hmm. these people, I say, the industry, (laughs) you know, as a whole, those people that don't know walking up to the conversation about reliability and you tell them if you're able to convert them to an understanding that reliability is something that can help them, they're going to go, they're going to hit Google. They're going to try and figure out the best way to do it. And the loudest voices out there are the ones that are selling the hardest. And the ones that are selling the hardest are the highest margin. And high margin is I4 integration mm-hmm. right now. I mean, there's there's money just dripping off of that mm-hmm. tree. And so they say, okay, we need a device on every motor and, and, uh, and mm-hmm. every press, every cylinder, you name it. Mm-hmm. We need a device. We need this whole new database to monitor it. And it's like – but – if you haven't even determined, I always say asset criticality because it's, it tells a story. My goodness, this is where my passions, my you know, I'm, my passions showing. Uh, I go into product-based manufacturers, injection, stamping, you know, you name it, right? And they're going to say, well, our our presses make our money. That's our most critical asset. But if you've got 12 of them that can all run the same tonnage so the jobs are interchangeable and all of them are running off of one single compressor, that's a single point failure, right? Nobody thinks like that. They think, okay, yeah, call the compressor people every six months or so. They'll change the oil. We'll be good to go. Do you know where it's at in its life cycle? Do you know are you what's your asset utilization as far as you, are you operating it outside of spec at a continual run, so on and so forth? Those are all reliability questions, right? So circling back, I apologize. No, you're good. It it all comes together, I promise. The I4 stuff, why I preach starting simply is until you start that criticality, you don't know where to start looking. If you don't know where to start looking, you don't know what your needs are. And if you don't know what your needs are, you might be implementing the wrong solutions. And that's where people hit burnout. They don't see the increase in OEE. Like that 20% increase in OEE is not unheard of. And it's... You talk to operations guys, you can increase my OE by 20, 20%? Absolutely not. That's an absolute lie. There's not 20% to improve on my process. Well, it might not be your process. It might be your assets. Mm-hmm. And we can increase that through, and through throughput and whatnot. If they don't see that 20% immediate returns on the I-4, are you ever going to get support for the reliability measures again? No way. Mm-hmm. So that's what we come in and we tell people, start simple, build into 
you know, the, these grander systems. We'll start with criticality, do a couple of services on stuff. Next thing you know, we've isolated out failure modes that have been happening for, oh, that's been doing that for years. Well, guess what? Now it's not doing it anymore. So that downtime that you've been suffering every single week for years, that goes away. That's an increase in production. And then they say, well, okay, how can we do better? Well, let's look at the next thing on the list. What's your next highest loss leader? You know, uh, if motor overloading mm-hmm. on a main asset becomes uh, the highest loss leading failure mode, then we say, all right, well, your motor windings are overheating because uh, bearing failure because of lack of greasing. We can do with the i4 stuff, we can do wireless condition monitoring on vibration. We can do wireless condition monitoring on thermal. We can have those just feedback on a, on a one-off. It's either over temp or it's operating good. We can have it feedback to a dashboard that monitors scale so that way you can do trend analysis because when you really get into it, the further you develop it, especially in those instances where you have those 10 other presses, if I'm monitoring the main motor on one, that's the other thing, Mm -hmm. you don't have to put it on all 10. Start with one because if you can establish a pattern of a failure mode and you can say, okay, we, every six months we were greasing it, but you didn't run it for three of those six months because you were short on jobs, and now you're running it three shifts a day, seven days a week, right? So you might want to switch to time-based. That information tells the story. Translate. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm getting in a little in the weeds here. No, you're all right. That information tells a story. That story creates a plan. You just have to have somebody who knows how to read it. That's where reliability comes into play. Mm. We can come in and we can look at those trend charts that that I-4 infrastructure is spitting out. We can say, based on this, we need to switch to a time-based maintenancing every 6,000 run hours. Mm -hmm. Before that 7,000 run hour failure mode, every 6,000 hours, we need to come in and we need to do a greasing of the main motors. Mm -hmm. Add it to the the PM schedule. I I think it all makes sense. Like I said, it's – and you've kind of alluded. It's a very – hard topic to discuss right because you're a little bit of this a little bit of that um but nothing everyone's familiar with right and so i do think when we talk about keeping it simple right because there's technology coming out every day that's new and cool and innovative and promises to tell you how to fix all of your issues right but if if you go all in and just throw everything at your problems, right, you are losing that a little bit of knowledge there. You don't know what's fixing it, right? You don't know, you know, I have 10 different things that all of my new Industry 4.0 sensors found for me, but what you're lacking, right, and you said is which one's going to have the biggest effect on my overall process, right? Because that's that's what you're going to have to go through then and now prioritize. You're either going to have to tone it back or you just start off one by one. Well, and that's also a little part of the process yeah. development is who are your stakeholders and what are they doing? Yeah. Because if they're too busy fighting the fires uh, because you didn't pay mm-hmm. attention to the highest loss leaders first, mm-hmm. right? If you've got a main motor, hypothetical situation, if you've got a yeah. main motor that's going down once a shift on overload, and they're constantly having to drag fans out and cool it and everything like that, you have a whole bunch of data backing up on these I-4 means that they don't even have the time to go in and translate. Like, Say you assign it to your maintenance manager because you don't have a reliability person and you bring in an integrator and there's your whole reliability budget for the years, mm-hmm. just integration. Now you have nobody translating, you have nobody doing process development, and you haven't eliminated any of the failure modes that are causing them to be running around firefighting. Mm-hmm. You just added something to their plate. You didn't take anything off. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you're not going to have buy-off for one. That person's not going to be like, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. I've got more work to do. Yeah. You know? And if you don't have buy-off, you don't have participation, you're never going to see the full value out of that data. Mm -hmm. So that's why we say start small. That's why we say do it simply. That's why we say build into it. It's, It's a living, breathing process that requires continual monitoring, continual improvement, and 100% buy-off. Yeah, I mean, from the the people that 
spend the money, right? They're going to look at it and say, you know, we just gave you all this money and you you made a change, but it resulted in half a percent of increased production. Like mm-hmm. I spent more on your time doing this fix than that. And so you might lose them, right, as, as from buy-in and say, you know what, just pull all the – I, I force stuff back because it's not worth my time, mm-hmm. you know? And so that's, that's where you're saying is, 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 you know, identifying the root cause and attacking those things first and prioritizing those things before, you know, just jumping in. Um, we are kind of getting towards the end. I do want to get maybe your best success story before we kind of wrap things up. I knew you were gonna ask this one. I prepped my brain. This isn't. About it. You this did isn't off. Me. While you're thinking about off it, though, cuff. I was gonna <laughs> say too. Um, I one appreciate what you're doing because yeah. I'm a full believer in like getting to the problem but instead of fixing the, you know, the reactions and the things that happen. So like I love that about what you're doing for companies. The other thing is I just keep envisioning you going into a factory and like just pulling off the duct tape that they've put on everything, you know, because uh, Matthew and I grew up with a problem solver dad and I am just picturing like all the little things he has around his house well, you, that are just you know, e- the, easy fixes, you know, instead the of popular diagram of it's, do you have a problem? And then there's duct tape and WD-40. Yeah. Right. So is it supposed to move? <laughs> well, yeah. And a hammer. My dad firmly believes if you hit anything with a hammer, it that's the first thing you should do to everything. try to troubleshoot it in. I, how many times did he take a hammer to the engine of my car and it ju- it did fix yeah, it? And I'm like, what? I I hate to admit that like 80 percent of the time it worked. <laughs> and so, but like, that's, you uh, know, that's the percussive whole, maintenance. Yeah, <laughs> the whole the whole like, is it supposed to move? No, duct tape. Is yep. it supposed to move? Yes, WD-40. And like that logic, like, yep. That's I mean, we're 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 seeing the end of a generation where that actually was the reality. Yeah. Right? Like that's, that's how they fix things. That's what I was going to say next is you're we're all kind of like in this renaissance of manufacturing, right? Where the old time workers, the controls engineers are finally leaving and people are moving up and different people are coming into companies. And so all those little fixes and all they're like, well, if the motor overloads, like this is what we do. Like it's not a procedure. It's just knowledge that people have in their heads from dealing with these problems over the years, right? So, like, by your company coming in, you're solving these problems at the root and creating a better work environment for these new workers. But a lot of companies don't have that type of knowledge documented or, mm-hmm. I mean, and it's probably not even, like, what they should be doing. Mm-hmm. But um, but with your company coming in, you're really solving all of those operational challenges that people are dealing with and a lot of people just might not know what to do. I think we talked about it recently. Um, when you're a first-time homeowner, you know, you you have an old furnace, you have an old water pump, you have all these things, and you don't know that there's a problem until something happens. Mm-hmm. And who do you like? Who do you call? Like, oh, I have this old furnace, and this happened. The only person that knows is the old homeowner. So it's like. You know, maybe you should come to my house. I have a very old house. Maybe you should find <laughs> the problems that, that are happening um, so that I can get to the root. Well, there's but. there's like the mentality, too, of of the current generation as they're starting to kind of leave or the older generation. Um, like the plant manager, those people, they have the mentality of, you know, uh, John Doe or whatever is, is here and he can fix those, right? And so we're not going to worry about it because he understands the machine. He can fix it. But as he leaves, you know, those issues become way more real because now they don't have that buffer anymore of a guy that can fix it. So they have to bring in a reliability guy to say, help me figure out what's wrong with my system. Why did I have, you know, because maybe they they think that the spending isn't necessary when he's here, but they're gone, right? Mm -hmm. And now they don't, they lose that tribal knowledge like Lauren said is, and now they're like, uh, we're gonna go out of business if we don't figure this out because our guys now can't fix it. Mm-hmm. They don't. They don't have the knowledge. They don't have the experience. They don't know how it's supposed to work or how it's supposed to look. It's it's older than them, right? 
that's one of the – that's <laughs> part of that yeah. secret sauce yeah. uh, mm-hmm. uh, that I was talking about is, you know, we'll get those calls where it's like, yeah. we don't need that reliability garbage. We just need you to come in and fix X, yeah. you know, and it's like, yeah. all right, we'll fix X. We're going to make some recommendations yeah. for improvement. Yeah. Usually they're going to be on the reliability yeah. system yeah. side, and we're going to keep mentioning it every time you call us in. And eventually a lot of the people, like, that institutional knowledge leaves mm-hmm. or they have a catastrophic failure mode mm-hmm. that we had predicted six months back, which yeah. happens more often than you'd think. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And we don't, we're not smug about it, but people call us up and they're like, hey, that thing that you said, we're like, it happened, didn't it? They're like, yeah. <laughs> what can we do to not do it again? It's like, Look at my quote. The first time they call, they just want the quick fix. The second time, they're like, no, we need the real solution. So the reason why it's hard is because we're just – we are so broad. So we got a couple, and I promise I'll be quick because I can Mm -hmm. be wordy. So one of them, we got a call from uh, a – they they do uh, chemical treatment Mm -hmm. stuff, and they have a chiller, one chiller in the plant. If this thing shuts down, they're they're hosed, right? Mm -hmm. Millions of dollars loss – every hour or so Mm -hmm. is what I was told. And they had already replaced the PLC and the chiller, and they said it was bad again, and they didn't have an integrator who could handle it, right? Mm -hmm. So we go out, we go to troubleshoot it, but what's the root cause? Why? How often do you hear of PLCs just puking, let alone multiples within a small span, you know? So we're taking a look at what it is, and we do a little environmental, uh, like the... Mm -hmm holistic environment of the asset, you know, trying to check it out. We do a little bit of uh, maintenance and inspection on the asset, and we do condition monitoring. And basically what it wound up happening, all of it boiled down to, uh, we put a trace on the ground and saw spikes in uh, noise on the ground, which was preventing the instrumentation from communicating properly. And that variance in the communication, they were thinking, was a failure mode on the PLC. But it was all just a bad ground. Mm -hmm. So we regrounded the asset and everything was fine. Come to find out, the very last thing they said before we leave was, I wonder if it's because of this new compressor that we installed right next to it. Mm -hmm. They (laughs) put in this monster of a compressor at the end of the line right next to this chiller. And they had interrupted the power. I won't talk too bad, but there was... They, they, Oversights. They, 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 no, well, that's as far as the, <laughs> the quality of the infrastructure. Yeah. It was an old facility, we'll yeah. say. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, they, but they had we got called because they had multiple people in there before who do mechanical contracting and do chiller mm-hmm. inspections and do chiller repairs, and they all threw their hands up. They're like, we have no idea what's going sure, on. It was completely fine. So yeah. without doing that good root cause and understanding what conditions to look at and identifying the failure mode, they'd have been in this perpetual state of PLC replacement. Mm -hmm. Now it's good to go. Mm -hmm. Had another one, conveyance, um, a motor. Hey, our maintenance guy, this motor keeps shutting off. We put a fan on it. Uh, The fan keeps it cool enough to run, but the conveyor just wants to keep stopping. Um, Lower price point conveyor, a lot of extrusion, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, so... Over the years, you know, change this part, change that part. Things could have been out of tolerance or whatever. So uh, they they were thinking it was just maybe uh, a bad motor. Swap the motor out. Same issue within two weeks. Mm-hmm. That's when we get called in. We take a look. Now, we didn't have to on this one because it was a simpler asset. Something like that, what we might do, uh, long conveyance or whatever, we might go through and do a thermal map with our mm-hmm. with our thermal imager and determine hot spotting because what it was was they're in the plastics industry and they have angel hair, uh, fine plastics, mm-hmm. and it got wrapped around the motor shaft and it actually created a, a wad of this plastic mm-hmm. in between the roller and the bearing to where basically you've got a break yeah. on mm-hmm. the bearing. And uh, we cleared those out. We replaced all the bearings and did you know cleaned yeah. the belts and everything like that, and it, it took off and they were good to go. Um, yeah, see, I think it's stuff like that that I mean, it's it's obviously there's there's a major value to manufacturers, and it's it's I think I kind of said it earlier was that type of maybe review is is prohibitive because production is so focused on output, right? Mm-hmm. That that 
that I mean, and, and truthfully, that's their job, right? That's what they're supposed to do. So, you know, if they have to push something harder or just go faster, like that's what they do. They don't they don't have time to stop and really analyze the issues. Yeah. And um and that's just the society we live in, right? That's manufacturing one oh one is is what you're outputting is paying our bills. So that needs to nothing stops that. So on the predictive preventative yeah. side, yeah. something like that, yeah. like you were yeah. saying, because nothing stops production, we'll come in, hey, recommendation for system improvement. Mm-hmm. We'll come in once every six months with our thermal imager and we'll do a bearing inspection on all of your conveyance mm-hmm. in the factory. And then you can schedule downtime. Mm-hmm. You can replace that bearing because those bearings are probably going to be good for two to five years, Yeah. right? You don't want to waste money by having a maintenance guy check them every month. Right. But if every six months we can just spend a half an hour or an hour, mm-hmm. whatever, just go through real quick, yep, everything's within spec, or no, it's not. Let's yeah. replace it. Yeah. But that forward thinking, mm-hmm. yeah, to your point, Matt, is where production sometimes has a hard point of I can't I can't suffer the downtime or why would I spend money on that? It's not a problem. We have plant managers that are like, hey, if I have downtime, I lose my job. Yeah. So I I I can't afford that. Mm-hmm. And so, so that's great. No, I think, I think what you're doing is, is, is cool. Like Lauren said, I, I think you're, you're providing a service one to people that don't need to know they need it. Right. But I think it's, it's cool that you're really coming in and you're just looking at everything from, from a different angle and saying, Hey, you know, you're doing great, but I can, I can make you extraordinary. Like, and I think that's a really cool thing, right? That's, that's really, you know, what we're, you know, you mentioned, you know, talking about whether or not to be on the show. And that, that's, you're the exact reason why we want to have the show, right? You're, you're helping move manufacturing forward and be better, right? And, and we need to be better, right? I, I don't know if your focus is, I'm, I'm assuming more U.S. based, domestic, but, um, you know, we, we talk a lot about U.S. manufacturing needing to be better and, and, and what you're doing is helping that. We, uh, we, we like to say that reliability starts at engineering and ends at yeah. decommissioning. Mm-hmm. Like even on the install side, people don't realize how many wear in failures you get. Mm-hmm. So doing a thermal inspection on the lugs to make sure that they're tightened to torque spec and you're not hot spotting, mm-hmm. killing electronics or, uh, ultrasonic imaging for leaks for vacuum on, uh, vacuum systems or air and stuff like that. Like we can save so much headache. Mm-hmm. at any step of the process and what I what people don't realize is like operations is my best friend because mm-hmm. nine times out of ten they're the ones managing the budget and all I want to do is see them win mm-hmm. my whole job is to see them win mm-hmm. so like you said it if we can just all raise the bar together that's mm-hmm. really like I get geeked about that no. our logo is just talking to my account manager I was like I can't wait one day till that little circle in the middle like we have shirts with an American flag on one and a German flag yeah. on another one and yeah, because we're operating everywhere yeah. yeah no that's great um uh before we wrap up anything uh the wrap up everything is there anything that you wanted to kind of toss in real quick um anything we didn't discuss no I think we all have a better understanding of what you do, and and it's much more concise. And I think we appreciate it. Hopefully all the listeners appreciate what you're doing. Like I said, it is is truly helping manufacturing. Um, So so thank you, Chad, for being on the show. Yeah. Yeah, Thanks for having me. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to the show. All right. Until next time. Bye. Bye. This podcast is brought to you by Promus Incorporated, hosted by Matthew Rawl, mixed and edited by Ben Parsons, and produced by myself, Lauren Rawl. If you have any questions or would like to be on the podcast, please reach out to podcast at promisinc.com.